Good evening. Welcome to this evening's TI Technology Webinar hosted by Texas Instruments, where you will learn how connecting science and math can strengthen students' understanding. I see that many of you are joining us for the first time, so we'd like to offer a, welcome, a special welcome if this is your first T-Cubed Professional Development Webinar. We'd also like to thank everyone for completing the live survey on the right side of your screen. My name is Mike Houston, and I'm the moderator for this event. I teach algebra and calculus near Pittsburgh, where I use TI technology to make tough-to-teach, tough-to-learn concepts accessible to all students. I'm very happy to introduce our two panelists tonight, Linda Antonone and Todd Morstein. For 29 years, Linda has taught mathematics and science to a diverse population of students at urban schools in both Texas and Ohio. Her passions are helping all students excel and making connections between mathematics and science using technology. She is one of the authors of the Real World Math with CBL textbook series, and that was a, a series that connected math and science using technology. Thanks for being with us, Linda. It's great to be here. And Todd has taught a wide range of science, mathematics, and technology classes for over 20 years. He has used TI technology in all of his classes and has helped create TI workshops in multiple math and science subjects. Todd was also selected to perform an experiment on NASA's Weightless Wonder. Thanks for joining us, Todd. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. We're expecting a large crowd, so your audio is muted. Feel free to send questions to all panelists using the Q&A window on the right section of your screen. We'll also send general messages in the chat window. Once we move to the teacher software, that right section of your screen will be replaced with a floating toolbar, and you can access the chat and Q&A windows uh, underneath that green floating tab. This session is being recorded, and as a reminder, we'll provide a link to the event certificate of attendance at the conclusion of the webinar. Once the recording is available, if you'd like to follow along with your handheld or software, and we really hope you will, we recommend doing this with the recording so you can download the activities and then pause and rewind the recording as necessary. We don't expect you'll have any audio issues tonight, but in the event that you do, try selecting Communicate in the WebEx menu, then choose Audio Broadcast and click Join. At this point, Linda is going to discuss our agenda. Good evening. We're going to begin with welcome and introductions. We plan to connect math and science using some pre-made activities, and these are from Math and Science Inspired, uh, like Waves and Spectrum, Trains in Motion, and a new perspective on a traditional uh, ball bounce activity. What we want to do in this evening is uh, discuss pedagogy and misconceptions between math and science classrooms and talk about ways that we can make connections. You'll also then learn about some free online resources. Great. Thanks, Linda. And Todd is going to discuss whoops, our expected outcomes. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time with some science-inspired activities and some math-inspired activities tonight just to show connections for students. We're going to discuss um, those overlapping uh, issues in the science class um, also to how it connects in the math classroom. Um, we're going to have a discussion from you guys uh, in the background. We'll, we'll be glad to answer questions. We're going to kind of open up things so that you can uh, talk. Um, we're going to talk about data collection along the way and how to engage students. Uh, we're going to look at a number of real-world phenomena and uh, we're going to talk about how to stay in touch after the conference or after this uh, webinar is over um, through some of the social meeting and also some of the com upcoming events. Great. Thanks, Todd. Linda, it's all yours. So one of the things that we want to talk about a little bit tonight is ways that we have made connections between math and science in our own departments. 
And in my department, one of the things that we do is uh, we have some common um, TI Inspire or just meetings together with math and science teachers. At our school, we host a two-hour um, Inspire workshop just where people come and share um, once a month. And we have both math and science teachers that attend. Um, I thought it was really cool last week when I did the zombie activity, and we'll talk about that maybe a little bit later where that came from. Um, and so I was doing zombies and talking about the growth, and the um, anatomy and physiology teacher next to me, she was talking about the brain, and they were doing the same kinds of things from a brain and science perspective, and we were able to make a lot of connections for our students, and they were saying, we're doing this in our science class, and I said, that's really cool. So we do try to work together as a math and science team. The other thing that I usually try to do is if I'm teaching something that I know has a science connection, I ask the students, are you doing this in chemistry? Tell me what you see or what you've done in chemistry. If I'm talking about growth and logistic curves, then I ask them, have you done this in biology? Have you done this in environmental science? Why don't you share with the class what you've learned so that the students who aren't taking that class can see those connections between math and science? Todd, did you want to add anything there? Well, those connections also, as, as, I, as I teach my science class, I always look for those uh, common equations that are coming out of the math classrooms that we know all of our students are in and try to convert all my science equations or at least how, show my science equations the way they're written and then talk about how that actually relates in, into the math classroom and that most of our kids have already done these equations. They just don't recognize them when we start putting uh, new variables on them or uh, when we get ugly numbers in science where we use scientific notation. And so one of the things we're going to address tonight is how those, how those issues, um, how we deal with those issues as we uh, work with our students. Todd, do you want to start the first activity? I sure do. Can you bring up uh, Waves and Spectrum? Sure. But by the way, Linda's my driver tonight, um, and so um, we will be. Linda will be driving along, and uh, it, it will be her computer that's doing the work. Um, all I get to do is talk tonight. So uh, Linda's bringing up an activity that's actually on the in Science Inspire Exchange. It actually is uh, Waves and Spectrum. And in, in science, we spend lots of time looking at, um, in chemistry especially, look at uh, how light can help us understand a lot about uh, different molecules, different atoms. And one of the things that we know about light is that light has speed, and we're, we're going to look at that. Uh, if you go to 1.3, Linda, for me, please. In, in my chemistry class, uh, I would give them this particular equation and we give them a constant of the speed of light. And one of the things I think is real crucial about all constants that, that students need to understand and also I think uh, many times I know when I was teaching math I didn't correlate this until I did a lot of science is that all constants within, within uh, mathematics are really conversions between two things. And so when I look at the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, really that's a conversion of um, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters in every one second. And so that conversion is actually helping me convert between meters and seconds. And most of you guys all know that, but it's something that we need to express to our students with those units actually are telling us something about what's going on. The equation below is actually... A lot of times we, we would call it an inverse, but it's a multiplicative inverse or a ratio, uh, an, a ratio problem or huh, an, a, uh, <laughs> Linda, you're helping me out. I'm blanking out right as I say this. What, what we have is we have, as one, one goes up, as the wavelength goes up, the frequency is going to go down. And in math class, the equation that we would see would actually be y or a constant is equal to y times x, or x times y in this particular case. And I try to express that to my kids because they've done some, they've done that before. So if we go to the next page, Linda, and say so I believe it's my 1.5. One of the things that we see about waves 
um, is Linda's going to show you kind of a neat feature here. And one of the things that I'd like you guys to discuss is what phenomena are you noticing as Linda moves this wave? How can you talk to students about what's going on with this particular wave? And, and all of us are looking at the chat window, so if you can want to give input at any time, then be more than, would be more than happy to answer it as we go. I set this out there for my kids to think about. and, and it's kind of a neat feature to think about even in your math classrooms is that wave has character. And as we look at this particular wave as Linda changes it, different wavelengths of light have different colors. And so as she goes through these different wavelengths of light, we're noticing that we're getting a color shift. Now, we only had a few colors to work with as we built this. Um, Hey, this is a Samantha. This is a feature on the calculator. We uh, actually uh, created this so that we could actually change the colors as the frequencies changed, uh, just to give them that representation. And so it's a really kind of neat feature that can really express what we're trying to tell them about those waves. Now, as we go forward, we can start calculating these waves. We can start calculating some of the characteristics of them. And so, Linda, I think we're on 1.7, I think, is the next page I'd like you to be on. By the way, you'll notice if, if you're new to the TI Inspire, this particular activity has multiple pages. And this all goes out to the calculator where every student, or out to the handheld, where every student can actually manipulate that wave. They can answer these questions. This is a multiple choice question where we can actually have the students gather or calculate a set of data. One of the great things about this is on the right-hand side of this screen, there's actually a calculator window. And what she's going to do is she's going to, Linda's going to do a calculation for me. And we know that the speed of light is a constant. So we're going to put that in. She's going to type C colon equals. And she's going to type 3 times 10 to the 8th. And she's going to use the E button to express 10 times 10 and press enter. Now, what she's just done is defined the speed of C as the speed of light. So if she types C right now and hits it, presses enter, C gives us that value of speed of light. If we want to calculate this whole thing, <laughs> what we're going to do is we need to know uh, the wavelength. So we're actually, Linda's going to hurt me with this, but I'm going to make her find a lambda for me. So under control in, in the book, there's a set of symbols. And she, oh, she's got it right there. So she's going to go lambda colon equals. What? Oh, that, was, that was from an earlier lambda. Go ahead and just scroll up and get that lambda and change it, would you? Press enter. And then she's going to type colon equals. And she's going to put in 400. And we're going to convert this. And I make my kids convert this. So she's going to put in times parentheses. And one of the neat things about the Inspire is it, it will put it in ratio form for us by putting control divide. And when we when kids get into troubles where they, they don't get uh, – they're doing some sort of mathematical calculation where they – have to do a scientific notation, they mess it up because they don't know if it's on the bottom or not, or they don't use enough parentheses. Here we actually know if it's going to land on top or bottom. So let's put one. And nanometers, there's 10 to the ninth nanometers in a meter. So I, I work with my students all the time to work on, on this ratio. And so she's going to go ten or 1 E 9. So she's going to get um, and then press enter. So right now, what we've done is we've defined the speed of light, we've defined lambda, and now we can solve this equation. Now, right now, Linda is on a CAS device, a computer algebra system. If you were on a numeric device, one of the ways to solve these problems would just simply be C 
divided by lambda. So go ahead and type that, Linda. And that should give us our correct answer. Now, since she's on a CAS device, though, I think the power of CAS is to actually have students solve problems. And so she can actually type in the equation C equals lambda nu. Hey, Todd, can I just interrupt for one second? Sure. We're getting actually a lot of really great questions and discussions in the chat window right now uh, while Todd's presenting. Um, the only drawback is that Todd and Linda and myself um, can't see them uh, because it, it looks like a lot of those chats are going, uh, sending to all attendees in the chat window. And you have the option, there's a little drop down that says send to. And um, the best thing to select is all participants, which I think is at the very bottom. And if you send your chats to all participants, it goes not only to all the attendees, like yourselves, but also to Todd and Linda and myself, so we can see what's going on as well. Just wanted to say that. Thanks, Todd. Okay. Thanks, Michael. So once we get it into this situation, Linda's going to hit press enter. And because we have these variables defined, we still don't know what new is. And the, kid, the students actually have to operate their equation just like they would on a piece of paper here, and, and it will help, uh, help them decide, am I doing this correctly? So at this point, she can, Linda can just simply type in divided by, and remember that we defined lambda, so she's going to press divided by lambda. Wait, what's divided what it, by lambda? <laughs> just press divided by, because what it will do is it pulls the prior answer or the prior statement. Notice it says answer. That's actually that prior C equals lambda nu, and divide by lambda again, and press enter, and it actually shows us what our answer is there. And, and so on the CAS device, we can actually manipulate the variables just like we would on a, uh, you know, on a piece of paper, and the students can do this so that they can actually see how their piece of paper works. Um, they can, you know, if they make a mistake really quickly, they know their results. All right. So just to show you some calculations and show you this document, uh, go ahead and move on, Linda, to um, let me pull up the page I want. Um, go ahead and keep going. These are all questions, multiple choice questions, as Linda flips through here, that help us to figure our students. Stop right here for a second. Um, can give us feedback about how much our students know. I'm, I'm looking at some of your chats just to see if there's questions that are popping up. Michael, if you want to stop me at any time and, and have me address a question, I'd, I'd be more than happy to. Um, when we get to this page on energy of a photon, um, H is another one of those constants. And if I know the units of the constant in, in particular, in this particular case, it's joule seconds. And really, joule seconds is a conversion factor, again, between energy and time. And so what we can do is we can use that. I, I teach my kids, and I spend a lot of time talking to my kids about equations will come from the constants many times. And so if they can learn that, then, then a lot of times they don't have to spend hours and hours trying to memorize equations. but remembering what the constants are and remembering the characteristics, they can learn a lot. Go ahead and move to the next page. And let's go to, I think we want to go to, here we would calculate again. Let's go to 2.3. For the chemist in the group, and actually the physicist in the group, um, Light's, light's a cool thing, and uh, what we've done is we've, we've developed a Bohr's model of the atom. And the N initial and N final are actually telling us where an electron is going to move between. And so if we go to N initial and change it to 3, Linda, and we go to N final of 2, and we start it, 
you'll notice it gives off a photon of light of a specific wavelength. If we do this again and change our initial to four and our, our final to two, we give off another color. And what, what's happening is you'll notice that the graph at the bottom is actually, actually representing the, um, the spectrum or the emission spectrum for a hydrogen atom. We can do all of the different series of light emission from a hydrogen atom. If we go to the next page, we actually have a numeric representation of these movements. And so kids can jump in and, and start to do some calculations. We can tie it back to the math class where we have equations like k equals uh, x times y um, and talk to students about, you know, to explain our, to explain our science, we definitely have to have the mathematics to, to help elaborate on it. Um, as we go further into this, Linda's going to do some, uh, uh, some physics activities for us, and we've got to look for the commonalities of the mathematical equations that we represent in science as well as the equations that we're using in mathematics. The other one, just as a, a side note for, for uh, the mathematicians, is the, the units are, are so critically important to understanding equations. And the more often we use them, the, the stronger the kids become actually with equations and also being able to cross those bridges over into the science. Linda, if you want to take off on yours, you're more than welcome. Okay. Um, oh, I'm, I need to move back to the beginning of this activity. Okay. Um, what we wanted to do was show you some activities that are math and science related from both math inspired and from science inspired. So this is an Algebra 1 activity, um, trains in motion, that's under the, I think it's the equations part of math inspired. And um, I really like a lot of things about this activity. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about it. So it begins with a simulation. So I'm going to reset this. And you have two different trains. And it does have. Um, a handout that goes with it, just like most of the activities, or I guess all of the activities in math and science inspired. And this one is having students begin by just observing the motion. And one of the things that we really want to do is have students be looking at things, making observations. So as opposed to the way that I maybe taught when I was a younger teacher, um, where I would be up at the board explaining everything to students, what we want to do now is say, OK, hey, Let's look at these two trains, and let's press the play button to start the animation. And let's think about what do you notice, OK? So you can have, and what the activity asks students to do is write at least two complete sentences describing the motion, comparing train one and train two, OK? And so you can think now about what would your students be saying. And some of the things, I'm looking for some chat maybe of what some of you might think that your students are saying. I don't see any yet. OK, it goes to the end, and then it starts over. OK, so you could talk about which train is moving faster, which train started ahead, what was the initial position of train two, what was the initial position of train one. Um, how do you know that one is faster than the other? Okay, and then you can have actually students coming up with lots of things on their own. Once you get to this part where you just have the trains moving, I think the nice thing on the next page is, now the one thing that I will say from a physics perspective, I would make a change right here where it says graph and use distance equals rate times time. I like to be able to talk about what rate this is specifically. Okay, so if you're thinking about it, what rate do you think we're talking about here when we say distance equals rate times time? So some people might say speed, some people might say velocity, and one of the important distinguishing um, things for us to do is to make sure that students understand at some point what the difference between speed and velocity is. Um, 
acceleration is also a rate. I see that coming up, but not the rate that we're looking at here. This one would have to either be speed, if you're th thinking about the trains just moving along, and the distance is equal to the speed times the time, or if you want to include direction, that's where we have a vector, and we're thinking about velocity, which is speed in a particular direction. And these are velocity, okay? So I would rather say velocity, distance is equal to velocity times time rather than just rate times time like it is in a lot of the math books. And the reason for that is I've had students where later on in science class I say to them, um, power is the rate at which you do work. And I say, what do I mean when I say rate? And a lot of students will say, all I know is distance equals rate times time. So that's why I think it's important for us to talk about specific rates. Okay, so as we move along here, this is really cool because now I can start this animation and on the left-hand side, I can see the two trains moving and on the right-hand side, I can see the distance versus time graph for each train. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the animation and you can look. And now you're getting, getting students to help make the connection between what's happening with the distance versus time graph by also looking at what's happening with the simulation of the movement on the left-hand side. And you can get to this point where then when you ask them what happens right here where the two cross, and sometimes students say they're going at the same speed. Well, are they really? If you look on the left-hand side, you can see that not that they're going at the same speed, but they're at the same place, okay, roughly. Mine's a little bit off but they're at about the same place at the same time. And so we can make that connection. Um, so someone just said, yeah, rate is not just rise over run. That's right. And that's one of the things in science I never really talk about rise over run. I talk about how the rate at which the distance is changing. Um, so this goes in and asks students to make lots of um, answer lots of questions. What does the y-intercept represent? Well, if I look at the y-intercept over here, okay, that has a real-world meaning now, and it's my starting position, okay, for each of these. And then if I think about what does the slope represent, okay, the slope is not just rise over run, as someone just said in the uh, chat, but it's actually talking about the rate at which this is moving, so it's the velocity. I like using velocity better. In this case, it doesn't matter because velocity and speed are the same time. But if one of these were coming down, okay, in other words, moving to the left instead of to the right, then we would have a negative slope, and that would mean a negative velocity, which just means we're moving in the opposite direction. Um, so I think this is a really nice activity where students can see the simulation and relate it to the um, distance versus time graph on the right. They can write an equation for each train. And one of the things that is really important to me in the math classroom and the science classroom is that they be able to look at these and actually come up with some physical significance. So for example, if I started, um, I'm gonna replay this one, one time really quickly. And I wanted to know where, so distance one is 80, okay? So if I say to them, what is the y-intercept? And people say, well, that's 80. I want to know what is that. That's the starting position. So I don't want them to just relate things and say, well, it's the y-intercept. I want them to be able to relate it to something physically. And being able to see this here, okay, as well, and see the other one is zero, that really helps them, I think, to make that kind of a connection. So this is one from Math Inspired that um, I think is really nice about making that connection between math and science. Okay, so I'm going to move, and there are some extensions to this also, which you can kind of look at on the Math Inspired page, and you can extend this a lot more if you want to do that. One of the Linda, things that I want to talk, yeah, sorry. Linda, I was I just, I was just, yeah, you know, with Common Core, as we write about mathematics, as we write about science, I think what Linda was just talking about is really powerful, and in, in to have kids elaborate on that 80 and 0 and those and those slopes or those rates um, is really important. And this is a place where they could they could actually, you know, if, start to write the story behind this very easily. 
Exactly. And and talk about how they know something is happening rather than just because somebody told them or because they they just think that. But they it helps them to be able to explain how they know something is true. Anything else, Todd? Not right now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I want the next one I want to go to is um, a data collection, and I've collected the data already. But one of the things I want to show you before we do that is, um, as a person who teaches physics and a person who also teaches math, so I've taught both of those for many years. Um, a lot of times we have students that say, you know, the math teacher saying, "Well, haven't you done this in physics?" and or the physics teacher saying, haven't you done these kinds of problems in math? And the students just look at us with these blank faces and say, I, I don't really know what you're talking about. And so I kind of made a little um, summary here so that you can see. So I want you to look at these and maybe send us in a little chat about what do you think. Look at these two, how we teach it in math, how we teach it in physics, and tell me why do you think students might be confused? I'm going to give you a second. We'll see if we get any comments. Todd, are you monitoring comments? I am. I'm throwing out some. Um, people are starting to throw out. Let's see. The variables are different. One of the, the, the big discussions that Linda and I've had for years is trying to get kids to, and, and teachers really to understand that those variables um, in science, we write lots of variables with that that have meaning. Uh, a is acceleration, V naught is velocity, D is a distance, and in in many times in math, but for the pure uh, beauty of mathematics, but a lot of times, you know, there's that five percent of kids that really love the theory of math, and the other ninety five percent that are saying, why do I need to do this? And I think crossing those variables back and forth of saying, here's what this variable means to a physical situation, makes it a whole lot easier to teach that, that AX squared plus BX plus C. Right. And if you look in the math books, most of our math books have um, everything is in feet still. Now, there are some problems now that are coming out in meters, but in science, we never use feet. Okay, we will always use meters. Um, and so when you look at, and I saw some of the chat coming through, um, yes, we're using different variables. We're using a different value for acceleration due to gravity, okay, which is, you know, most of the math problems that deal with parabolas and real world situations are with gravity. Um, in math, we're using x as the variable. In physics, we're using t. In science, we generally start with the initial value and then add on how it's changing. So I might start with my initial position and then add on the initial velocity and the acceleration terms. In, science, in math, we always start with the highest power of x and move down. So I, one of the things that's really important if we want to make connections for students is to help them understand how these things are connected. Go ahead, Todd. I see you wanted to say something. But yeah, Leslie just kind of made that statement um, that kids kids don't see them as the same, and they don't unless we. I mean, we have to specifically point out that you know what is it, how do these relate to each other? Um, I you know I see kids all the time. They don't understand commutative property of addition, and it's kind of nice to go back to simple properties and say you know we're just moving these variables around, and that the mathematics no matter where they're sitting, they're still the same. Um, but we have to, I mean, as science teachers, we need to bridge the gap to math. And I believe the math teachers need to bridge the gap the other way. And I think the more times we restate that, the, the better off our students are. Exactly. So, and part of it is we have to understand that, and this is why it's good for math and science um, teachers to get together. We have to understand that we're teaching it different ways so that we can make that connection for students. Because if we don't talk to each other, we don't know. We might just be thinking, oh, that teacher in the other subject, they don't even teach this stuff very well because the students don't, they say they've never seen it. When in fact, they have seen it, but it's just in a totally, it's presented in a totally different way. And so this is why we really need to talk to each other and communicate with each other to make these connections for students. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to look at, so I want to um, do a ball bounce kind of activity, and I'm, I call it drop it, and I think I have it. And, and you're going to be getting this, um, Michael, right? They all will get a copy of this. You'll get a copy of this at the end of the yep. workshop. Um, okay, so here's the way I started. So in the old, even when I first started doing data collection, usually when we wrote the real world math book, we were so excited that we could collect data. And so we would do this, you know, we'd collect the data and we'd run a regression and we'd be so happy that we could get an equation and we would want the students to figure out what do the variable, you know, A mean, what does B mean? And basically we found that they could run the regression, but it was they were just doing mechanics. And they couldn't really tell us what any of those things meant. Um, so we moved more towards modeling and showed them how they could find an equation without running your regression so that they could tie a meaning to, you know, if I'm going to do um, a quadratic, maybe I would do it with the vertex form and have them figure out what does the A mean, what's the horizontal shift, what's a vertical shift, and tie all of those to something physical and specific. And now I've kind of moved even a little bit farther from that because now my students know how to use this technology, and maybe I show them a little bit about how to do it at the beginning, but because they're using it throughout all their courses, by the time they get to my course, I can say, okay, so now you know how to find a regression, you know how to find an equation by choosing two points, you know something about parabolas, so now I'm going to turn more of this over to you. So here's how I started this activity um, the last couple of years. So we're going to drop the ball, so I usually drop the ball, and I have the students predict the position of the ball from the CBR as a function of time, and also predict the height of the ball as a function of time and make a sketch for each one of those and compare them with other people in their group. So the first thing that I do is have them make a prediction. There's a lot of research out there that says um, that when students make a prediction before they collect the data, their understanding is deeper and richer. And I think back to when I was a student in science, and a lot of times I would just do the lab, get the graph. I would never write the conclusion until I had to turn it in maybe a week later. And so by then, I didn't always even remember exactly what happened in the lab and how all of this related together. So now if you ask a student to make a prediction, and usually what I do is I make them sketch it out, I walk around, I look at what they have, and we talk about their predictions. So actually I'm asking them to make two predictions. One as the distance from the CBR as a function of time, which is the hardest one for them. And I'm going to show you what that looks like um, right here. Okay, so if I just do distance from the CBR, it looks like this. So these parabolas are opening upward, and the floor is actually at the top of the graph. Okay, and so um, you want to think about why that is. And then I want them, once we talk about that, usually they can get the height from the table or the floor as a function of time. Okay, and that one looks more like this. But I want them to know and figure out then what kinds of transformations would they have to do to go from this, what's actually being collected, to the other graph. So I have them discuss that with their group next. So that's this next part of what do they have to do, okay? So um, then I want to think about can we actually collect the data? I, I'd like to put the motion detector on the ground and just drop it on top of the motion detector, but we can't. So there is a way with Inspire, which is really nice, where the students can actually go in and reverse the data and actually zero it. And so in the activity down here, it gives you directions on how to do all of that. So I'm not going to talk about it too much, because what I really want to talk about a little bit more are, is the analysis. So once they collect the data, okay, so I'm going to go back and look at it, and I'm going to take some um, answers from you. Once they collect the data like this, then the first thing I have them do is sketch the position, which is now the height, since we reversed it, and choose at least two characteristics and relate them to the motion of the bouncing ball. So we're taking chat. So, you know, send in your comments. What do you notice about the position graph? And we're going to maybe share some of the comments that you're sending in, like I would be sharing with my students, having them send in comments. Are you seeing comments? Todd, Mike? 
Why don't you at least restate the question? Um, you okay, know. restate the question. Okay, so yeah. I have the students collect this data. They get the data, okay? So my first question is sketch the position, which is now the height because we reversed it. We reversed it. Okay, so now um, sketch the graph and choose at least two characteristics and relate them to the motion of the ball. Sorry, I have a dog. I think your dog's just trying to trying to answer the question. Yes, <laughs> I think she got it. I just put her outside. <laughs> okay, do you, do you have some? I missed the comments coming in. Do y'all have some that you can share? Looks like the starting height is about 0.8 meters. That's good. That's one thing. What else do we notice? And then I just saw uh, from Ginger Starting over velocity. time. Okay, so I'm not looking at velocity yet. I'm just looking at position. So first of all, I just want them to look at the position graph only, which is the top graph. What comments do you see there? As time goes on, the bouncing height decreases, okay? Yep. The position is dropped top. with time, so it damps, yes? Anything else? What about the shape of all of these? What do they look like? I might not tell them what that shape is, but you might say, yeah, there it is, Mr. Bird. Thank you. It's a parabola. And so I just have the students generate as many of these as they can. And usually what I do is have them go like from group to group. Okay, group one, you state one thing. Group two, you state another thing. And go from group to group until we go all the way around. And I say, if somebody said yours, make sure that you have plenty of them so that you can come up with something else, okay? Um, you might notice that at the top it's par parabolic, but at the bottom it looks like they're pointed. And why would that be happening? So there are lots of things that then, if students are looking at this, they'll come up with things that we haven't thought of, maybe, because we know kind of sometimes what we're looking for. So the next thing I want you to do is look at just the velocity versus time. So that's the second graph at the bottom, okay? Send us some comments. What do you notice? So I would have each group write down at least two, but I usually say as many as you can comments about that velocity versus time graph. So let's see what you have to say. Velocity is decreasing over time. Velocity drops. The velocity is decreasing over time. The velocity is approaching zero. Velocity decreases, sharp changes, steep slope overall decreases. Can you guys, um, there's too many, I can't keep up with them. Do y'all see I'm, I'm watching. <laughs> Todd, the, you want to add a couple more? You have steep so slopes and not as steep decreases slopes. over time. Yeah. Graphs are Negative. similar to that. Absolute values, they're similar to that. Okay. Goes from negative to positive. Okay. So I'm looking at, so yes. So first of all, here, if you look at a particular bounce, and here's the nice thing about the, um, the software. You see these points up at the top where it has the dots that are in blue? Those correspond with the corresponding points down below. Okay, so you can kind of match things up as far as times go. All right, so I want to look at, there's several things. Um, these velocities are coming down, and what do you notice about each of them? So a lot of people say these lines are getting shorter, which is true. Okay, but what else do you notice about each of these lines right here that represent while the ball is in the air? So this is while the ball is in the air right here. And what do you notice about that one compared to this one? It might have come up already. They're Very linear. linear. What else? Parallel. Parallel. There we go. These lines right here are all parallel. Do you all see that? And so let's think why they're going to be parallel, okay? And those are all parallel because they have the same slope. There you go. Good job. Same slope. And if this is a velocity versus time graph, 
that slope represents the change in velocity over the change in time, which is same acceleration. There we go. Several people bringing that in. Okay? So that shows that each of these, okay, has the same acceleration, which is really cool. Okay? That the students can see all of those parallel lines, and hopefully they can come up with that rather than me telling them that. Okay? So now I want you to, the next thing is I want you to look at the relationship between the graphs. Okay? So what relationships can you tell, you know, if you look at a certain point on one graph, and you try to relate it to what's happening on the other graph. So let's see what kinds of comments that you can send in. So we're looking for the relationships between the position or the height graph. Okay, max and mins are zero on the velocity graph. So if you look right here. Great. When you're at the maximum, that corresponds to zero on the velocity graph. Okay, a couple of people are saying that. Anything else? The velocity is positive to the left of the peak, so this is where um, the ball is going up. And even though it's going up and this velocity is decreasing, it's still positive until we get to the other side. And now where the ball is dropping, the velocity is negative. Okay. Anything else? Now, see, if you were my students, I'd make each group be able to go around. So if I have eight groups in my class, you'd all have to say something. So you'll get all kinds of other comments slowing down at the left. Okay, so you can kind of see where is it slowing down, and students can get an idea of what this negative velocity means. Okay. Um, you can also think about what's happening right here at the tips. This is where the velocity is changing over a very short time, okay, from negative up to positive, okay? So some students might make that connection between going right here from a negative velocity when it hits the ground to almost, not quite, almost a vertical line, okay, because it's changing so rapidly. So there, the point is there are lots of connections that students will make, and I want them to make those connections rather than me. Okay, then the next thing that's really cool is that I can grab and I can select out one portion of this. So I can just drag across here and I can go to the menu and data and I can strike a portion of the data and I want to strike this um, outside that selected region. So now I can get and look at just one parabola like this and have the students do some more analysis. So on the next page of the activity, which you're all going to get, I ask them to do some other things. So here are some things that I want them to do. I want them to figure out the acceleration. So explain how the acceleration due to gravity could be calculated from the velocity versus time graph down here. Okay. And I want them to calculate it in at least two ways. So that could be choosing two points. That could be um, finding a regression. That could be whatever, I mean, I guess those are the main two ones, but they might come up with some other kinds of things. Um, slope is the slope of the velocity versus time graph is going to be the acceleration, so I want them to figure that out. Then I want to know, can they figure out the acceleration due to gravity from this parabola graph? So I'm kind of pulling in what they know from mathematics and saying, can you figure out this, okay, from either a quadratic regression or could you do, what else? Could I do it by hand by choosing, maybe finding it with the vertex formula, find the vertex and use their Algebra 2 skills, maybe to figure out the equation using transformations? Yeah, I could go up here and find the vertex. So once I can pull this apart, then I'm leaving it up to the students. And instead of the old way that I used to do it where I would say, do this, and next step is do this, and the next step is do that. I can figure out, do the students really understand what's going on by saying to them, you show me how you do this. And then they have to really start thinking about all those connections that I want them to make. You know, one of, one of the things, said, Linda. That's the table. Okay, so I can show them in the table also. Right here, it shows all, all the uh, 
things that are deleted, but I can move down through the table. Go ahead, Todd, and see my data in the table as well, uh, wherever it is. Go ahead, Todd. I got. I can jump in here for a second. Okay. Um, I love the fact that it strikes data because I think uh, prior to the Inspire, I don't think that was possible. I think we actually had to delete part of our data set. Right. And so uh, that, that's a conversation I think should be brought up with students: is you know why are we striking data? Um, you know, does it mean it's not good? Uh, does it mean we? Collected incorrectly, you know. Like I think there's some co like really good conversations that can happen just from discussing whether or not you're going to strike data. And I love the fact that you can unstrike the data that has been stricken. So if you make a mistake, or you know, out of the discussion, you realize maybe that shouldn't have been struck. You can unstrike it. Or you can go to the next parabola then and analyze the next one and see how does that compare to the first one that you had. Righto. There's a there's a thread going through right now where uh, I think is is very pertinent to this is is the whole idea that there is uh, the inquiry really comes out when we ask the proper question and Linda does a really good job of of putting those questions out there and saying okay we have multiple ways to solve this mathematical problem and I think you know as math teachers what we do is usually we we teach them the most efficient way to solve a problem. We don't teach them all the ways to solve a problem. And this one has many, many solutions for the exact same problem. And and by asking those questions and allowing students to demonstrate their knowledge, we give them, you know, a lot more ownership over their what they're learning. And the other thing that I want to add um, onto that is using Navigator. So I have Navigator in my classroom. And so I can call on specific students and have them you know, just share. So as we go around and debrief the lab, different students that use different methods can just pull theirs right up, and that I can make them for the presenter, and right from their seat, they can be sharing with the entire classroom the way that they solved the problem, and then all of the students learn from that, because then we have this discussion, and they can ask each other questions back and forth. And it's a really rich discussion compared to what I used to do when I had it all laid out and just told them step by step what they should do. You know, there's this this activity is is amazingly rich. Um, I remember last time I taught Algebra two Trig, I was actually able to use this particular activity three different times during that course. Um, I used it for uh, sequence and series, um, where I just took the peaks and did the decays on on what each each bump what you know each uh, vertex was. I used it in exponential decay, and I also used it when we did uh, parabolas. And we were able, you know, you extend this one type of problem into all kinds of avenues, and the kids, once they've done it once, they're very good with collecting data. And you get their hands on it, and they have ownership over that set of data. And it reaches all the way up into calculus, where they're talking about rates of change and derivatives. So it really is rich. Yeah, you can use it in harmonic. You can actually use it in some energy equations. Also, another another place that I've seen is looking at the I've actually done with the kids the the tangents as you collide with the floor. If you know their slopes, um, you can actually calculate the uh, you know you know the mass of the ball that you're bouncing. You you can actually calculate the energy loss as it collides with the floor and leave the floor and predict the height of the next parabola. So as Todd said, you can put a tangent on this graph also and be looking at the tangent and comparing that with the velocity below as well. And you can look over to the left-hand side and you can see what the slope of the tangent is and compare that with what you have below, which is really nice also. You could also do an integral 
So you could do an integral under the velocity versus time graph and show that it's the change in position if you want to add some calculus or some advanced physics in there. The one thing I think Linda and I both realized by doing uh, hands-on labs, either, either in math or science classroom, is that the value of, a lot of people say, well, I don't have time to do this. But the value uh, proposition that you get out of it, the students walk away with way more understanding of the mathematics and the science than they do when they don't get their hands on it. Um, I know we, ha we need to cover a certain amount of content, but if you don't cover it with them, you know, where they main maintain it, it doesn't help. And I agree totally with Todd because there are often times where students know how to give me the right answer, but then when it comes to when I give them some data and they have to interpret it, um, they they really have trouble. And so the more that I can do with this to help them understand the concepts early on, then the better off they do throughout the course and they can apply it to lots of other things that they do. Okay. I'm going to turn this back over to Mike. Mike, are you ready? I'm ready when you are. Okay. Maria, most of these are not just a discussion in our classrooms, but actually you you hand off a set of, the students actually gather a set of data, and there's a, the activities are actually written so that the, kid, the students will um, start asking those questions. We, we can either ask those questions that Linda asked on paper, or we can verbally ask them. Thanks, Todd. So um, I'm going to do a few things here just uh, in conclusion. Um, but as I'm doing that, please feel free, uh, if you still have any remaining questions for Linda or Todd, um, please feel free to ask those now. There are a few resources available on our website, which I think are worth taking a minute to show. Again, our website is education.ti.com. And if we select under the Professional Development tab, scroll down to Online Learning, and on the left-hand side, choose Webinars. and then move over to the on-demand webinars. And so what's listed here are all the webinars that we've recorded previously, all the way back to 2011, and there's been a few. Um, I know a few people tonight were asking uh, about maybe looking at some simulations uh, on the TI Inspire uh, app for iPad. And it just so happens that our last two weeks uh, of webinars focused on that. 